Praise the Lord, church. And it's yet another wonderful day for us to be sharing the word of God. My name is Robert Mwando. Today, I would like to share with us about God's tenfold purposes for the church. And I want to start with this scripture from John chapter 15, verse 2. The Bible says, any branch that bears no fruit will be cut off. A couple of months ago, I spoke about the fruit. In that teaching, my focus was on being fruitful as an individual believer. In the last couple of weeks, I have engaged in several prayer meetings virtually and continue to participate in the ongoing Uganda Jubilee Network 50 Days of Prayer and Fasting for our nation, Uganda, particularly focusing on leadership, the electoral process, and governance issues. God's word has come through to us, not as a pat on the back, as some would have loved it, but as a rebuke, a stern warning from a loving father. You can see that Hebrews 12, 5 to 11 says that he rebukes those he loves. In this season of elections, what is the role of the church? Do Christ's followers have any responsibility to play? My answer is absolutely. In Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, the Bible says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. The book of Micah in Chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, even puts it better. But I'll just read verse 2 for, this, for the purpose of this sermon. Verse 2 says, Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Mount Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There are seven main spheres of influence, and John Enlow refers to these as the seven mountains of society in his book, The Seven Mountain Prophecy. The description of these spheres as mountains fits in very well with the scripture texts we have read in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and Micah chapter 4, verse 2. And these spheres include business, also referred to as economy, governance or government, which includes politics, family, religion, that's where church and the church of Christ comes in, media, education, and entertainment. Entertainment also includes culture and celebration. Today, however, we will look at the current state of the church in line with God's original intent for her. The idea is to awaken us as church and cause us to repent, meaning change our mind and direction back to God's purposes. A purposeless church, powerless church, fruitless church is simply a loss to God. Here is God's tenfold purpose for the church. One, to overcome forces of evil. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 to 11, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, in us, by us I mean church, God intended to display his wisdom, power and authority against forces of evil. He wanted to pull down strongholds, uproot satanic foundations, overthrow ruling spirits, 
and plant and establish the heavenly kingdom on earth. We can see that as well in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. His intent was that through the church, the world would know their creator as opposed to other gods. His power demonstrated through us would cause men to say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Elijah type of confrontation with Jezebel's Baal prophets on Mount Carmel is what unbelievers need in order to turn to God. Spiritual warfare fought at celestial and terrestrial and aquatic levels is very critical. Number two, the church is called to make disciples of all nations. God's intent was that the church would execute the Great Commission, as stated in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Make disciples and teach them to obey and submit to God. We have simply let God down on this one. Our priorities are different. A believer or even a church congregation isn't ashamed to spend a year without winning a single soul to the Lord. Missions and discipleship programs, if any, receive the least funding in most churches. Our priorities have shifted to church projects and other money-making ventures. We have simply disappointed God. On the other hand, Quite ashamedly, the world is discipling us. We follow their agenda, their patterns, their fashions, their behaviors, their everything. We do as the world does, live as the world lives, to the extent that there is largely no distinction between a believer and a non-believer. Number three, we are called to be agents of redemption. In this endeavor, our proclamation of the gospel would bring liberty, healing, and restoration. Our prophetic voice in a desperate world would be the source of hope where there is none. God intended that the church brings his counsel to the people and accomplish the work Christ had started. Jesus' redemptive assignment left to us is to preach the good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, and release for the oppressed. Once redeemed, we are to plant them as oaks of righteousness, according to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. To what extent have we done this? Your guess is as good as mine. And God is concerned. Number four, we are called to be the salt of the earth. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. His intent was that the church would display a different value system. Like salt, it would flavor the world and save it from moral decay. Increased wickedness, corruption, sexual perversion, murder, bloodshed, idolatry, and all forms of iniquity all point to the fact that the church is as saltless as the world. As an institution, the church no longer has any moral authority to condemn evil since we are not devoid of it. In fact, we perpetuate it by our indifference and silence. Number five, God has called us as church to light up the darkness-ridden world. His intent was for the church to be the light in a world full of darkness. The light of Christ in us would dispel any trace of darkness whenever we appear. 
Yet our light, if any, has largely been so dim or hidden that darkness still covers the earth. We are asked in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 3, to arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Are you shining? Are nations benefiting from our light and kings to the brightness of our rising? I'm reminded of one kingdom in this country where the process of installing the king is marred by a lot of idolatrous cultural practices. And yet, church adds her blessing immediately after such installation. This sends wrong signals and is partly responsible for the syncretism in the church itself. Purpose number six, we are to be agents of reconciliation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconcil reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Our mandate as a church is to reconcile the world and its systems back to God. Notice that in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 19, creation itself eagerly awaits the revelation of the true sons of God. The church to be liberated from the bondage it was subjected to and be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Is today's church up to the task? Are we even aware this is our mandate? Purpose number seven. We are called to receive and extend God's kingdom. Daniel says, but the saints of the highest will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. In Psalm 110 verse 2 to 3, God the Father tells his son how he was going to extend his rule from Zion, meaning from the church, using the church. Christ was true in the midst of his enemies. And God announces in verse 3, that his troops would be willing to fight for this to happen. Notice from here that the extension of the kingdom of God takes a fight. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Unfortunately, church has not understood the gospel of the kingdom. It has taught the gospel of salvation that prepares believers to get saved, be ready to be evacuated, as it were, to heaven. We have not been taught to occupy. We have not been taught to have dominion and to conquer the world for God. Our mandate as a church should have been to prepare kingdom-minded men and women that would influence every sphere of, of life, be it politics, business, media, entertainment, and all the other spheres for our God. The church's mandate is to raise the Daniels, the Elijahs, the Josephs, the Esthers, the Deborahs of the Bible, men and women who are tested and approved as Christ's ambassadors and sent into the heathen world to transform it. That's the prophetic and apostolic role of the church. Has church done this? I am not sure. Not when we still believe in the secular sacred priestly dichotomy. 
that God is not in the secular world, but only in the confines of the church, and serving him can only be done by those ordained and priested. The laity must simply be on the receiving end. They cannot serve God. That is not true. Purpose number eight. We are called to be separate. We wouldn't affect the world positively if we were yoked with it. God insisted that Israel had to be separate as a chosen nation, lest it be soiled by evil. Similarly, Paul warns against being equally yoked with unbelievers. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Paul says righteousness and wickedness have nothing in common. Light and darkness have no fellowship. And Christ and Belial have no harmony. The temple of God and idols have no agreement. Our yardstick is scripture. Purpose number nine. Bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11, and Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 8, each of us has been endowed with a spiritual gift for the purpose of strengthening the body of Christ and ministering to others. Yet most churches have either suppressed the exercise of these gifts or failed to develop and deploy them. The fear is that if the laity are empowered, they will make the ordained redundant and irrelevant. I recently had a testimony of a man who was banished from a church because through his healing and deliverance ministry, a blind man had received his sight. In other dioceses, prayer and intercession is fought. Overnight prayers banned. As such, the church is spiritually barren and cannot bear fruit. We must bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 is clear on this. And the fruit of righteousness as well. Jesus says, any branch that bears no fruit will be cut off and burned while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear even more fruit. John chapter 15 verse 2. And the last purpose that God has given his church is for it to declare the glory of God. Psalm chapter 96 verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, where is this glory? I pray that you will be restored to the original purpose of God, that you will be the true light, the true salt, a light on the mountain, and an influence in this world. That is what God has called us to be. And remember, the church is not the building. Church is every single believer who follows Christ, and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.